from Romans chapter chapter 4, verses 1 to 8 and 16 to 22. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was recognized. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who work, who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but something due. But to one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So also David pronounces a blessing on those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whom, against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. For this reason, the promise depends on faith, in order that it may rest on grace, so that it may, so that it may be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the, of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into, into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith, when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No, distru no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, therefore it was reckoned to him as righteousness. The word of God for the people of God. The gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 to 14 and 21 to 22. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, what does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? As if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it and more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. This is the gospel of our Lord. So here in our second week of uh, my attempt to uh, offer something of a Methodism 101, uh, I wouldn't call it a class, but it's more of a sermon series, um, I want to talk with you again about grace. Last week, uh, if you were here, we learned about the sacraments, specifically the two sacraments that we observe as Methodists, and that's uh, baptism and Holy Communion. And you saw the baptismal font right there. And I gotta say something. So wrestling that sucker, it's right over here. It is heavy. Um, I, I did that all by myself to get set up for the service. And then before I left last Sunday, someone had wrangled it and put it back up here. Would that individual or those individuals identify themselves? I gotta know. Nobody here? Maybe they don't want to admit to it. Well, whoever did it, Maybe they're watching, I don't know. Thank you, like my God, that was amazing. So I just wanted to highlight that. All right, well, um, one of the reasons I think that Christianity has become so popular in this country in particular uh, is because it's so accessible. So consider what happened on your way in here, something that you might do just kind of automatically when you walk into a church. Were you charged an entry fee? Was there a cover? Cover charge? No, right? Um, were there any qualifications necessary for your attendance this morning? No, of course not. Very accessible. 
there might be one, right? And it doesn't keep you from participating, but it might keep you from participating in all aspects of the church. And that would be the sacrament of baptism, right? In some churches, you have to be uh, uh, baptized as an adult. And as we learned last week, in the Methodist Church, well, we baptize infants too, because we believe through confirmation, which happens later in life, that a young person um, or an adult might later confirm the vows that were taken for them at baptism, all on the road to salvation, a one journey of faith, as it were. Now, I must say, um, this has not been the state of things throughout time, like your ability to just walk in the door and come in and park yourself on a pew and do absolutely nothing. Like, that's not been the case throughout time. In fact, I would dare say that as the Christian church, we have found all kinds of creative ways to take something very simple, like remember in the stories of Jesus, he'd always be on the countryside and people would just come sit down and listen to the man talk. Um, and we've turned it into something complex, you know, sometimes very systematic. So take, for example, the evolutions of Christian denominationalism throughout history. You're going to get a history lesson this morning, folks. Um, and it might seem that on the surface, especially in old Europe, that these differences of belief seem to be differences about theology, you know, or beliefs about God, but in fact were really just expressions of monarchy. So here's an example. In medieval Europe, Christianity became so segmented primarily because of the beliefs of a nation's ruling monarch. Uh, take the Anglican Church, for example, which I'll talk about in a moment, through which John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism, um, that's, that, that right there is like a prime example. So. If you remember your history, there was a time when the Empire of Rome uh, stationed troops in Britain, right? They sought to conquer it. They did. And through that relationship, Roman Catholicism eventually became the faith of the land. Many peoples were converted to this religion, and it was as much a state religion as it was just a faith. But it had a uniquely Celtic flair because those were the peoples that lived in the area, the Celts. And eventually this unique form of Roman Catholicism became widely practiced as the Roman See, that's the governance of Rome, the religious governance of Rome, established Augustine of Canterbury as the first Archbishop of Canterbury, which as you know, especially in recent royal functions, is a very important role and for nearly a thousand years, Britain was solidly Catholic. But when King Henry VIII, and there's been a lot of movies made about this, wished to have his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled, he enacted the Act of Supremacy, which I think is a very fitting name for what he did. Of 1534, he declared himself the supreme head of the Church of England, abandoned Rome entirely, and he replaced the Pope as the leader of a new Anglican church. My God, like, how did he have that in him? Incredible. I am the new Pope. <laughs> Many strands of Christianity, in fact, began in this way, uh, with the act of a monarch, but usually only after a great conflict. It even became the law in the 16th century. A doctrine was created known as, and I'm going to mispronounce this, but cuhus regio eius religio. That's Latin. It means his state, his religion, emphasis on he, and was a key component of the Peace of Augsburg. You might remember that, the ending of a bloody religious war fought between Catholic and Protestant forces. It permitted the division of religious belief between Lutheranism, which was brand new at that time, and Catholicism within the states of what was once called the Holy Roman Empire, which had nothing really to do with 
the area of Rome and more about Roman Catholicism. And this was an area that once encompassed nearly all of Europe, including Germany, Italy, and much of Northern and Eastern Europe. Now, I, I do enjoy my Christian history, but rather than carry on with this history lesson, I just wanted to make a point to you. And that's that many of the truths that we claim about our beliefs all started somewhere. And frankly, not in a place that we might have thought about much. So you really got to dig. I don't think Jesus imagined that the beliefs he shared with his disciples would have become so intermingled with state politics. But hey, every generation has managed to do just that, you know? Maybe it helps to lend justification to ideas that might be less theological and more monarchical. But if we allow ourselves, as the founders of Methodism did, to return to scripture and its simplicity, I can't emphasize that enough, its simplicity, we might recall a story from way back in Genesis about how God declared a man righteous, and that man was Abraham. Now for your reference, the story I'm quoting is from the 15th chapter of Genesis, and it forms the crux of all our ideas about salvation, like about its possibility for human beings. So Abraham, before he was Abraham, and was just Abram, you know, his first name, was worried because, you know, he had been called by God to leave his homeland and come to a new land at God's direction, and he's the only one that got the message, and he had to convince his family and all of his household to uproot and move because God said so. And this man was getting on in years, and he realized, hey, it's been a while. I don't have any heirs. Who am I going to pass all of this on to? He'd obeyed God's call, but he was ultimately concerned about who would carry on after him. God promised Abraham that his offspring would number the stars. In fact, that's what Abraham means. It means father of multitudes. And God, who knows the heart of people through and through, when he promised Abraham, that's going to happen. You're going to have a descendant, and not just a descendant, but descendants upon descendants upon descendants. God realized that when God spoke this promise, Abraham believed it. Abraham believed in the promise. That was Abram's act of righteousness. He didn't do anything to earn the righteousness. God conferred it because Abram believed God in his heart. And God gave him a new name. Now, the stories of Abraham, and specifically this story, became the tool that the Apostle Paul would use to bring Christianity to non-Jews. It became the bridge that helped connect Jesus' atoning sacrifice to the idea of salvation and covenant for everybody, for all people, not just Jews. Unfortunately, English translations of Greek texts kind of rendered a sort of artificial division between Jews and Christians. And it led to a lot of anti-Semitism and the persecution of Jews throughout history. I mean, Jews were blamed for killing Christ. They killed the Savior. But that wasn't so. I mean, Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> uh, Jesus was not attempting to found a new religion. He was refining the one that he was in already that might have missed some important information about who God was because of the propagation of tradition over the years and its authority. By the way, John and Charles Wesley, our founders, were both Anglican priests in their own right, and they themselves did not set out to create a new religion, not in the UK, not in America, 
Like Jesus, they only sought to refine the church that they were a part of. And refine, not reform, which is a very different thing. Now, as Christians, we're big on salvation and how Christ's work on the cross saved us from the power of sin. Now, salvation doesn't appear to be a major emphasis in Judaism on first glance, but the truth is the story of salvation is baked into Jewish history and practice. So God is active in the world. When you read the stories of the old Israelites, what does God do for them? God secures a place for them to live. God gives them an identity. God forms them into being a people of light for the nations. And what we as Christians call salvation isn't really different from that vision. We too believe that God is active in the world, so active, in fact, that people received the very personage of God in the form of Christ. And yet people also condemned him to die according to worldly ideas of justice and righteousness. And we do the same through our sin. We reject Christ. We reject the very idea of God for, frankly, very selfish, temporary benefits that ultimately do not deliver the peace that we might have sought for ourselves, but lead only to greater hunger. A hunger Jesus understood when he called himself the bread of life. Eat of me, he said. Those that do will never hunger again. Not the same kind of hunger you get, well, in the next half hour or so. Now this laid bare the idea that something is very wrong with people when they find themselves capable of condemning someone who has done nothing to merit condemnation but has instead only served to help others. And that's really commonplace in our world, you know, because the worldly agenda is based on self-advantage. And every year that goes on, we optimize for greater and greater self-advantage. We work very hard to gain our advantages in life. And when someone comes along calling into question how we might be harming others, when we seek these advantages, well, what do people do? They respond, often violently. They dehumanize anyone that might hold them accountable. We just don't want someone telling us that we can't exploit others for personal gain. Now, we won't put it that way, of course. We want to be thought of as good people. We want to be thought of as doing well. We take it personally when someone might think of us in that way. It sounds awful, but in practice, it is what we do. We don't want to be judged. So for Christians, salvation is of critical importance. We understand that people are driven to sin for these reasons, and we are grateful to God for the justice and mercy to be found in Christ. Now, God's work at Pentecost, and I don't know if everyone here remembers Pentecost. It was that moment when the apostles had gathered together in one place, and the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to profess the gospel in many languages. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a tangible event that made it unmistakable that God was working in people to spread the news throughout the earth, that God cared so deeply about people that instead of condemning them for their sins, which like we do all the time, had instead sent emissaries into the world to teach an altogether different reality, one liberated from condemnation, one much more in line with God's vision for the world. God wants to save us from ourselves, equipping and sending more and more people to hold others accountable in a loving way, in a loving way, for their sins. 
that they might encounter the God that expects their best and then calls them into service, no matter who they are or what they've done, because such is the nature of God's love for us. And God does this in every language, in every way imaginable, some ways we probably haven't even encountered yet or might approve of, and does it by sending people entirely unacquainted with where they may be going or who they might encounter there to speak the message God gives them and helps the messenger not the receiver of the message, to convey the message in a way that makes sense to them. God does not ask people to change themselves to receive the message. God asks the messengers to allow themselves to be changed by God to deliver the message faithfully. This all sounds like a bad idea to me, frankly which is probably why I'm not God. I mean, I think it's a fearful way to go about spreading the gospel. Can you imagine? People do not like to change. Come on. They will change if the situation demands it, but, well, I'd say most people prefer moments of change to be abrupt blips on a lengthy timeline of comfort and normalcy, you know? well air conditioned with an abundance of snacks. And I think that shows a profound distrust of God, the author of life. Change is a normal part of life. It happens all the time. At any moment, life is changing. It must. It's part of the process. And yet the world is a fearful place. So much of the world cannot be changed by us. This might be why the evangelistic task, you know, the bearing of the message hence, might be too great a task for us to bear. We don't want to go out into the world and risk ourselves or be judged by people we may not care anything about. And we forget our faith too easily. We forget that God has command over all the world over all our faiths. Faith is what enables us to trust God enough to answer when God calls, to stop putting our comfort and advantage first and simply follow, as Abraham did, opening us up to that moment when the thoughts of our hearts and the intentions of our minds line up and God proclaims our righteousness. <clears throat> so what I've done here is try to illustrate for you an entire journey of faith with absolutely no buzzwords, anything like that, you know, from nothing to hopefully something. Now, in Methodism, we believe that human beings are meant to be renewed in righteousness. We call it regeneration. Some people call it being born again, you know, reconciled to God, enabled to serve. That moment of decision, that's justification. We recognize that in baptism and confirmation. But it doesn't mean that we won't ever fall back into sin. No, of course not. We're human, we're not perfect, and we were not created to be. God knows what God built. And we don't have to be perfect, because even when we give up on ourselves, God is always at work in the world, invested in our salvation. And that, siblings in Christ, is what we call grace. And grace in three forms. Now here come the buzzwords. Prevenient, always there, with a dogged intent on helping us to find our way justifying or justification, as I mentioned, when we turn to God in baptism and actually receive God's forgiveness for ourselves, aligning with God's way, and sanctifying, 
helping us recognize our ongoing need and dependence on our Savior, guiding us back on the path. By grace, through faith. That's it. That's all there is to it. There is no secret ingredient. There's nothing else that needs to be added. If somebody keeps adding things to it, don't believe them. And besides, you probably already know that they're telling lies. We can tell when we are loved by God. We can feel it. One promise, one idea about God undergirds everything that we believe. That God was so interested in human beings that it wasn't enough for that God to just be known by us. God wanted to be experienced for our sake that we might find ourselves, when we find ourselves, in the lowest places, we would find God there too. And this promise was true from God's first whispers to Abraham's soul all the way until now. May God's name be praised. And amen.